Hello, good morning. We are today at the IVA show here in Nuremberg in Germany. This is the largest uh, show on the industry just for equipment, uh, clothing, weapons, ammunition, optics and all that. We're going to be checking the show around, but the reason we came here is to do a seminar about bow hunting. Bow hunting is not legal in all the countries of Europe and we're going to try to promote and try to share and let the people understand what bow hunting is really about and hopefully it, it's, it's okay my presentation. We are here representing the European Bow Hunting Federation and we're going to do a seminar. I am Anders Geyer, I'm the president of the European Bow Hunting Federation. Pedro Ampoero is one of our associates, he's a very accomplished hunter. He will tell his story and his journey with bow hunting. I'll leave the word to you, Pedro. Thanks a lot, Anders. Thank you. Okay, so why are we here or why uh, everyone is talking about bow hunting, why there is some people that are super huge fans of bow hunting and one, why there is some countries that bow hunting is illegal and people think it's a bad thing to introduce it in their country. We all have our own reasons, but I wanted to share my why I bow hunt. And since it's very complicated to explain it, I wanted to explain it with an, with an example. Uh, that roebuck I spotted the opening day of the season, it's probably one of the biggest bucks I have ever seen in my area. And that video I took it at 120 meters. If I would have got the rifle in my hands, that buck would have been dead on the opening day and it would have mean this much. I decided to challenge myself to do it with the bow and this is just one of the many examples that I have. It's not my best video that I have, but I think it's a good example and roebucks I think you all are going to be feel identified with. And I hunted that roebuck for three months until it finally gave me an, an opportunity. Uh, my dad was very nice to let me try it with the bow because he wanted also to try to hunt it with a rifle. And after three months, I finally got an opportunity. There was a lot of hard work. That roebuck right now, it's 70 meters from myself. I have shortened the video a lot but I spent watching that rowback for 15 minutes and it's 70 meters is still like very close distance but it's still too far for the bow. So I really had the opportunity to enjoy this bug without knowing that we were there uh, in a very special way and it finally offered us an opportunity. We were not able to get the arrow impacting the rowback on camera, but it sometimes happens. We do a lot of videos and it's very hard to try to get everything on camera. But I think it's very special how, what happened, no? So I, I shoot it right now. You kind of, kind of see the arrow coming from the right side. I hit the rowback. And in four seconds, the rowback is dead. We were in the middle of the forest Three months of hard work, one of the biggest roebucks I have ever hunted. No one knew that we were there. The roebuck didn't knew that we were there. The forest, there was no noise. No one knew that we were there. And that was super, super special. Why I bow hunt? Because the bow forces me to, to experience more. With the, we, all, we all are easy to get tentated because when we have a gun, I will have shot that back the opening day of the season. And I'm not trying to compare rifle hunting versus bow because I hunt with everything so it's not that one is better than the other. I just put, I'm going to put a lot of examples with the rifle because I think you all know more about rifle hunting than, than bow hunting. So that, the bow forces me to experience that buck in such a different level and different scale and some people may think like, are you a trophy hunter? Yes I am. I like big trophies. I think they, they are harder to get. They are a bigger challenge. But at the same time, uh, this is a clear example that a trophy doesn't mean anything. That same buck shot the opening day will have meant to me this much, and after three months of hard work, meant a completely different thing. Who I am, because I haven't presented myself. So I'm Pedro Ampuero, I'm 34 years old, I'm from Spain. 
I was able to quit my engineering job and started working in the industry for a clothing brand from, for Kuyu, and we produce a lot of videos around the world. That has allowed me to experience a lot of opportunities and to spend over 200 days in the field a, a year, which doesn't make me a better hunter, it makes me a luckier hunter because I'm able to spend more time in the field, which brings me more, more opportunities. How I end up hunting with the bow? So my father introduced me into, into hunting when I was five. I then started hunting with the rifle. Later I switched to the shotgun with a slug, with open sights. And the effective range of a shotgun, it's only like 50 meters. So that's when I got really hooked about getting close to the animals and when I decided to make the switch to, to the bow. My dad had a bow that back then he was not using because of an injury on the shoulder. And when, when I was 14, so uh, like 20 years ago, I started hunting with the bow. That guy, you may be worrying, uh, wondering wh who I am, is the guy with the long hair. That's the bad thing about the bow. It makes you with the stress, you lose a lot of hair over the years. So, And actually that's the biggest wild boar I have ever shot in my life. So it's, it's better to be lucky than, than good. I started hunting with the bow and I think it's a huge advantage because um, at the end, you hunt more and you kill less. Spain, it's a country that most of it is private land, so tags are expensive. You can only shoot a limited amount of deer. So for my dad, it was an opportunity to have his son hunting a lot of days in the field, but only using one tag, which, is, which makes a lot of sense. And I also have to clarify that it's not exclusive, that the fact that you hunt with the bow doesn't mean that you cannot hunt with a rifle. I hunt with the rifle, with the shotgun, with the, uh, with the bow, with traditional bow, I hunt with everything because the weapon you use is just a small part of the hunt. You can hunt with the rifle the same way you hunt with the, with the bow. The truth is that if you have the rifle, you are, the temptation is very big sometimes and the bow forces you to go one step closer. Was it easy to start hunting with the bow? There is nothing easy about hunting with a bow. I wish I could tell you uh, the opposite, but you need to be in good shape to draw the bow back. You need to learn how to shoot the bow, which is way more complicated than it looks. You need to learn about equipment. When you have all that figured out and you know how to shoot the bow, you need to get close to the animal. Then the animal needs to be broadside, and you need to draw the bow back without the animal seeing you, and then it's looking at you. So there is nothing easy about bow hunting, but I think that's a good thing. In countries like Germany that bow hunting is not, a, is not allowed, I think it's a good example that every guy that wants to get into bow hunting, it's a really committed hunter. Because if not, they will drop along the way. Since there is nothing easy, those guys that really want to get into bow are guys that know that they have to be responsible, that they, uh, they have to put the time into bow hunting. And I think that filters a, a lot of hunters that they want to try the bow just once for a weekend because it's the new trend. That doesn't happen with the bow. You need to go fully committed. And that's what I realized when I started that bow hunting is a lifestyle. You cannot shoot the bow one weekend, leave it on the closet and come two weeks later and, and bring it out and expect that you are going to be shooting the same way because if you don't shoot the bow for a couple of weeks, it completely changes everything. I was self-taught. 20 years ago, there was not much information. That rowback is spot and stock hunting rowbacks. It's one of my passions. I have many, but it's one of my passions. It took me three years to harvest my first rowback with the bow, so it meant a lot. But it's true that I was self-taught, and now like with associations like the European Bow Hunting Federation, they are putting a lot of time to educate hunters, and the, the, you are going to be with a good level to go hunting way quicker than what I had. When I started, there were a lot of concerns, not only from me, but also from my friends from the hunting area, because they were like, how many arrows, Pedro, do you need to kill a wild boar? And how, and how much they are going to be sticking out of, of the body? And penetration was something that it's a, a myth, no? Like, we all have in mind this from the movies, that the arrow is going to be sticking all the way and the penetration is going to be very, very weak, but that's not true. A penetration, if you have the right combination of arrow, broadhead, and a bow, isn't an issue. And that's mathematics. That's something that it has been solved. So it's not something that you have to 
do try and error. Depending on your poundage, the animal that you are going to be hunting and the error that you have, uh, you are going to get good results. And this is an example with a um, wild boar in Spain. That's a pretty big wild boar. You guys know that wild boars are, are tough. And I wanted, I could have put a bigger animal, but I think wild boar, you guys all know very well how they are. And I shoot it right now over there. And you see here the arrow. So you see how quickly the arrow went through the animal and, and passed through completely, got a clean pass through on the animal. So both, and these are all my videos. So I haven't tried to look for the best video out of the internet to, to put a good example. I, there is, this is very typical on bow hunting. And this is another example that I wanted to share. This is bow hunting ro uh, red deer, which is one of my favorite things. I, I don't know if there is noise or not on the videos, but it was pretty unique angle because the stack came between me and the camera guy. So the stack is like five meters from the camera guy and it's like 12 meters from, my, so from, my, from me. And the camera guy got the exit of the arrow. And I think it's, I shoot it there and he got the exit. Actually, my friend almost died to capture that because the stag just jumped above, uh, over him. That's why we both hunt, because we make uh, some great friends and live some great experiences. But if you see in the slow motion, I think it's uh, pretty unique to see how clean the arrow goes through the animal that it doesn't even change the trajectory. So the energy that the arrow has, since it has a lot of mass, it's way bigger than most of the people think. Okay, so bow hunting, how I started and, and how I progressed. I think there is different levels and bow hunting should be a journey. You shouldn't try to start bow hunting doing the hardest part. There are some ways of hunting that are easier than, than others. And I started ambushing or stand hunting, then spot and stock, mountain hunting, international hunting, and I wanted to cover some of those steps. This is stand hunting. Uh, it's the type of hunting that we have more things under control. We kind of, kind of can't predict where the animal is going to come from, at what time, uh, where he's going to be standing, at what distance. We are going to be able to draw the bow back without being noticed that the, we are there. And it's a beautiful way of hunting because you really enjoy the animals doing their things super close. That's 12 meters from, from me. And it's also a great example, and it has, it's a great application for, since it's, the bow is silent, and it's very safe weapon. It's a great example of hunting in urban areas and controlling populations of, of wild boars in, in urban areas where you cannot be taking fire shots. The wild boar died right there and everything again. It, I think the silence of the bow, it's very, very special. Now that, okay, Pedro, this all sounds fantastic, uh, great shots, great penetrations, but some of you may be wondering like, but Pedro, all the animals are running away. Are the animals suffering or why? They're running away, it's not, it's not efficient, the bow. The thing that we need to understand is that the arrow kills completely different than the cartridge or a bullet does. The arrow, what it does, uh, the, the, I mean, like a rifle, when you impact an animal, the bullet has a, a shock and it produces a shock that many times drops the animals on the spot. The arrow, it's a clean cut, a very clean cut. And it goes through and it makes the animal bleed out. The fact that the animals run or that they are bleeding out doesn't mean that they are suffering more than, than with the rifle. Because since there is no noise and there is no stress, sometimes they don't even realize what's going on. And I wanted to put this example this is me hunting this year, hunting mouflon in Spain. This is a very young mouflon. I just drew the bow back to kind of test myself because it's like seven meters away from me, but I was not gonna shoot it. And it was a good choice because when the mouflon finally spoke, another bigger mouflon came out of the, of the thick and offered me an, an opportunity. It stopped there, I was already at full draw. I shoot it, the arrow goes through. The mouflon kind of doesn't know what's going on and it stops to look around. He doesn't know what happened. The arrow had just go through. And I think that it must be very similar to when you read on the news that someone got into a fight and got stabbed by a knife and didn't realize that he got stabbed until he got, it started bleeding or fade. 
and I was able to put a second shot. He was going to die right there, but just to finish him off quickly, and he died right there. So the fact that the animals run doesn't mean that they are suffering more. And actually, there have been some studies in Spain where they have analyzed the amount of adrenaline on the animals, on the wild boars that they were shot on urban areas, on a population control, and they were not finding under adrenaline symptoms on the, on the animals. Next step that I started after doing a lot of hunting on the stands and ambush and all that type, I started hunting a spot and stock. It's a complete different, it's way harder because you don't have anything under control. The animal distance is gonna change all the time. You need to get really close to the animal. The animal is gonna see you. You need to learn how to walk, timing it's all when to move, when to stop, when to draw back. But it's a great thing and you learn a lot about animal behavior and ab about yourself and about hunting animals. So I think it's, a, it's my favorite way of, of hunting. This is an example in Uganda, in Africa, spot and stock in bushback, which is very similar to, to roeback hunting. And we were able to get close enough to, to do bushback. That's it. And again, arrow goes through, yeah, it starts bleeding, and it just it drops uh, in behind those those bushes. So, a sport and stock, shot. it's a great way and also very very efficient. Yeah, okay, again, that sounds sport and stock sounds fantastic, but Pedro, the higher or the more complicated the hunting is. Uh, what about the efficiency? What about the chances of wounding an animal? Because you are getting, everything is more complicated. We could understand that when you shoot at 12 meters, you have a lot of things under control, but sport and stalking, you, you don't have many things under control. I want to, to mention that it's very important to know our limitations. It's key that we know how good we are, how, how well we shoot, that we train far. Both are very accurate, despite some people may think they are not. For you guys, when I'm training for an international hunt, I train up to 100 or 120 meters, and you are getting groups like this. So if you compare it to a gun with open sights and no rest, I think it, it will be similar. So you can get very accurate. The, the fact that I'm training that far doesn't mean that I'm gonna take shots at that distance, but it will give me a lot of confidence when I'm shooting closer. The truth is that accidents happen, uh, and it happens with any weapon. We get a lot of adrenaline, we get overexcited, and we make poor, poor choices. And it happens with the shotgun, with the gun. I have, been a, I have guided a lot of hunts, and with the rifle also accidents happen, and it's something normal. If we, the day that we lose that adrenaline rush, probably is the day that we stop hunting. And I wanted to put uh, this example. I'm not allowed to tell who is the hunter, but uh, we got a beautiful opportunity to do Ibex fighting, that's 30 meters. That's a short opportunity that uh, the, bow, the hunter will take any day of the week. I know how she shoots and she will take it any day of the week, no problem, but with adrenaline you make mistakes. And I wanted to highlight something, the arrow just hits the animal on the, on the muscle. And uh, I wanted to highlight that Injuries with an arrow are more likely to be recovered by the animal. It's a clean cut. Uh, it's not like the, like the rifle that the, the bullet burns tissue. So if it's a muscle shot, animals will recover fine. And actually that Ibex keep fighting and we saw it the following day with no, no problem at all. Mountain hunting, that's one step higher, more complicated. That's probably, I have said that it's my passion, a bunch of things, but this is probably my, my real passion. I think that sometimes we have the picture that the bows are meant for stand hunting, for hunting wild boars and deer, but mountain hunting is also an option. Uh, it provides a lot of freedom, but it's true that it's really complicated. The terrain, it's, that's Mongolia. The terrain is wide open, uh, so getting close to the animals is way more complicated. The, Physical effort required makes a huge difference. Every time you need to get close to the animal, you get to go around. Sometimes some stocks takes up to two or three hours. You arrive there and the animal is not. So physical effort is another challenge. But when you have only a bow in your hand, the truth is that there is nothing impossible. Because I have been told many times, like, it's impossible to hunt a Samoa with a bow. 
But when you only have the ball, it's just like, you just need, it's a matter of time and a matter of effort. And actually that, I had to travel twice to Mongolia, to the Altai region, to harvest that, that ibex. So another of the myths that some people are scared about bow hunting is the illegal hunting and poaching. So when someone tells me, no, I'm not, I don't like the bow because they don't make any noise, so it can be a great tool for poaching. I laugh because the amount of effort you, it's required to harvest an animal with the bow, uh, with the equipment now, nowadays people have, that we have thermal scopes, we have silencers, we have what a poacher needs. I don't know, I'm not sure what they need, but I guess that what they don't want is to be a lot of time in, in the hunting area. They want to kill an animal and get a, a, out of there as quick as possible. And the bows are completely the opposite. You need a lot of time, a lot of effort, then you need to recover the animal. So definitely it's not something that I would be worried about. Finally, international hunting, I think is the hardest type of hunting you can do. Not because hunting abroad is more difficult than hunting in, in your home. Animals can be as hard. But the thing about international hunting is that you have limited time, which is a huge factor. You have, uh, the hunts are expensive, which also adds to the pressure, the, no, the fact that you know that you may be going there and wasting a, a lot of money. Uh, you don't know the animal, you don't know the territory, you have to go with a guy that maybe don't, doesn't understand bow hunting, so it's very, very complicated. But it's true that in inter hunting internationally can provide some amazing hunting opportunities and some very cool experiences. And it's pretty sad that uh, for some people it's the only option to hunt because it's illegal to bow hunt in their countries. This, is a, this clip is from the Yukon, hunting moose. When you see it here, when they come to the cold, they don't look like very smart animals, but it was, we, we, we were there for 20 days to get this opportunity and two different trips, so it's way harder than it looks. But to be able to have the largest deer species at 20 meters, again, the arrow goes through the, the, the moose with the same setup as the, the setup I'm using for deer. And that's the largest deer species in the world. And some people may think, okay, that's, that's a successful international hunter, but that's not. If you want to be a successful international bow hunter, you need to understand that getting the trophy is not the important thing. You are there for the experience. You are going there for, on a vacation, you are going to spend there 10 days in the mountains, uh, learning a new culture, hiking up, hiking down, and the fact of harvesting the trophy cannot be your goal, because if not, you are going to be very frustrated. I have. I don't know, a lot of examples, like, uh, for example, in Turkey, it took me three, tri three trips to harvest my first Besuar Ibex, which combined were 24 hunting days. A lot of my friends were telling me that I was stupid for giving it a third try, because it was a, a lot of money. But at the same time, I think I have an experience in Turkey and with Besuar Ibex that non none of my friends have, because I was able to spend 24 days knowing the animal, knowing the cultures, knowing the mountains, and when I was able to connect with one, it meant way more. So maybe I'm just a too positive person, but I think that's, that needs to be your, your goal when you go on an international hunt. Or here is an example of Hassan. This is in northern Cameroon. I hunted with him for Lord Derby Ilan, and he was an, he's, I mean, he still is, he used to be a poacher with the bow and started working as a tracker. And he's a, an exceptional tracker. And it was funny because when we harvested the Lord of the which is the largest uh, antelope in, in the world, we were super stoked because spawn and stock on tracks is something that has been done only a couple of times. And we thought that we were the best hunters in the world. Like we were hugging the pH and I was like, we are the best hunters right now in the world. And Hassan came to me and told me, I don't want to ruin your moment, but I have shot seven Elan myself with that bow. So it kind of puts you into perspective how bad of a hunter we are and how much we have to learn. And that, those are the experiences that you need to target when you are traveling internationally. To meet people like Hassan and get that the experience is way more important than, than the result. And just to finish, I wanted to just wrap up all that we talk. I think that introducing bow hunting in every country of Europe, it's a great change. Bow hunting is different. It's another option for our community. The more hunters that we are, the better. It's 
bow hunters are typically, because of the filter that I mentioned, a more committed, more educated, they are willing to put the effort, and they are focused on the experience and above the kill. Which in a world that we, we are lacking of hunting opportunities, the more we learn to focus on the experience above the kill, the better. Bows are ethical, despite the concept that we, some of us have. They offer good penetration, quick, clean kills. Animals are more likely to recover when they are injured, and all in a, in a silent and safer environment uh, without disturbing the, the environment. Bows are not efficient for illegal hunting, so it's something that we shouldn't be worried about, and that there are no limits to hunting with a bow. We can hunt whatever we want. Uh, we can hunt the mountain, we can hunt in Africa, anything, it's just a matter of time and, and passion. And for, all, for people that are here from the industry, bow hunting is another line of business. So uh, people that hunt with a bow can also hunt with a rifle and at the end we are building a stronger community, uh, more lines of business, so I think it's a good thing. And I can't thank enough the EBF for all the effort they are putting because in Spain we, have, we are very lucky, we can both hunt as much as we want. So we only enjoy the good part, but people like the guys from the EBF that are all working hard around Europe to get bow hunting legalized. And I want to get the word to Anders, the president of the EBF. Thank you. Thank you, Pedro. That was uh, fantastic. Uh, as you see, this is an adventurer. I, I was uh, having a similar experience in uh, Zimbabwe here last December. We were chasing elephant for 11 days, did not see an ele elephant at all. So, but it's an adventure still. I'm super happy going there. And uh, thank you very much for this uh, educational talk. I'm going to do the dry stuff, you know, charts and... and, and uh, I'll just briefly mention what uh, EBF is. We are founded in 2003. Juha Kulme is sitting here somewhere. No? Uh, him and I, a Finnish guy, we had the mutual discussions. There was a need for a European organization. So we've been at it for almost 18 years now. Uh, we're an associate, associated member of FACE. FACE is the Joint Hunters Association of Europe. They're lobbying a lot in Brussels, where it's needed to be lobbied for pro-hunting. So we're also, as I, as I mentioned, an associate member. Uh, our, and our members are basically national bow hunting associations or federations. This is a timeline from 1945 when uh, bow hunting was regulated in some nations like Yugoslavia. And this is up to 99. And then I have, and this is recent development. Macedonia, Serbia are the latest nations joining uh, and, and utilizing bow and arrow as a hunting method. The map is probably better. You see yellow countries are not possible to bow hunt in. And when you look at uh, the world, worldwide map there on the lower left, you see most of it is green. Yeah, FACE, I mentioned that. They did also create a position on bow hunting a few years ago. Bow hunting is kind of reintroduced into Europe, so they, they needed to do that, and that was a mutual agreement. Also, uh, Pedro was touching that a little bit in Spain. They have issues with wild boar in urban areas. Very big problems in some urban areas, and I think it's nine different cities now employ bow hunters at night, because there is no noise at all. They are basically, what is that? Uh, working without no one knowing that they're there. I think there are some special forces guys that have, have a similar expression, you know. But they, Carl, I think in Madrid, they're up to 500 wild boars now over, is it seven years or something? So they're, and it's very close to the urban areas or, or even in gardens. Bow hunter education is another issue that we are very strongly promoting. We believe that educating hunters is very important. And, and bow hunting is kind of an addition to the normal hunting. So we look upon it, you say it's, it's touching us and it's a little bit more time-consuming as what I use. I like to actually 
compare it to fly fishing. Because fly fishermen are usually very, very obsessed about what they do. And it seems like bow hunters also are obsessed. We like this. We enjoy getting close. And, and benefits, I think you touched that. What I see is that, especially in Denmark, they have used the bow hunters, and in Finland as well, to promote hunting as, as an accept, an accepted uh, management form. And so they put the bow hunters up front because they seem, they seem that in the public's eyes, uh, bow hunters are very well accepted in these nations. And it's also in the US they have the same experience that bow hunting is very well accepted by the public. And we have some international cooperation with other nations. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pedro. And thank you for listening.